you for the day. And we thank you for your kindness and your grace and your mercies, which are always new, always fresh, always sufficient to cover our sin. We thank you for the day we have to gather and worship, and we thank you, Father, for just reminders that technology just can only take us so far. And so we're thankful that you gave us your word in a book, not on a CD or a DVD. I'm so thankful for that. Thank you for Jesus and our time to look into your word. May it be profitable for us. May it be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Yeah, those times happen, don't they, huh? Well, it's good to see all of you. I, I think it, uh, I, I expected that more of you would be out camping or doing something else today. So maybe you just got your reservation in too late and the campground had filled up. It's funny, I think that now's the time after Labor Day that I will go to places like that when the crowds kind of thin out a little bit. Calvin Coolidge. Now, nobody here would have heard Calvin Coolidge or had seen Calvin Coolidge, but Calvin Coolidge, our 30th president of the United States, was a very different kind of president, very much unlike most politicians today, in the sense that he was a man of very few words. He was a quiet and somber man whose nickname became Silent Cal. Once, after returning home to the White House from a church service, his wife asked him what the pastor's sermon was about, and Coolidge abruptly replied, Sin. <laughs> he didn't say anything else. And when his wife then asked what the pastor said about it, Coolidge coolly answered, He was against it. Well, today we're going to be talking about sin from Genesis chapter 3, and it will come as no surprise to anyone that God, like President Coolidge's pastor, is against it. So, as we've already seen, Genesis is the book of origins. It's the book of beginnings. In fact, that's what Genesis means. It means beginning. It means origins. So it should be no surprise that along with giving us the origin of the earth and, and all the creatures on the earth, including human beings, as well as the origin of Satan, that this book of Genesis also provides us with the origin of sin, and specifically sin in the human race. But what may be surprising to us is how early in creation sin shows up. I mean, Adam and Eve have just barely moved into the Garden of Eden. They, they've only been there a short time after just being married, and, and they, with, with some help from Satan, in this very short period of time, conspire together to sin against God and thus plunge themselves as well as the rest of us who are their human descendants into spiritual ruin, spiritual corruption, and spiritual death. So what happened? I mean, what happened? Well, we were looking the last couple of weeks at the origin of Satan, so we know that Satan happened, and we know that sin happened. But you know, sin probably came before Satan, and that's something you need to think about a little bit. Um, and then you need to ask yourself, well, who is more powerful? Is Satan more powerful, or is sin more powerful? Well, sin is what caused Satan's fall. So sin is very, very powerful. And most of us have experienced the power of sin in our lives in some pretty powerful ways. The rest of us who may not know what I'm talking about just uh, probably are living in some sort of uh, other kind of reality. You've just redefined your life in ways that the Bible probably would not. So again, what happened? Well, sin happened, just like it happens and, keep hap and keeps happening to us too. But, but how did it happen? Why did it happen? And what does it now mean since it has happened? And what did God do about it? And these are the questions that Genesis 3 is going to answer for us. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and please follow along 
as I read what should be becoming a very familiar passage to us. Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate. And she gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Sin is really not all that complicated. Oh, I realize that our sin does result in complicated situations. And, and some of our complicated situations that have resulted because of some sin we gave ourselves two years ago may last until the day we go home to be with the Lord. Often sin results in complicated situations which are often experienced in the context of broken promises, broken vows, broken laws, broken relationships, and broken people, all of which sin produces. Sin can only produce one thing, and that is brokenness. It breaks everything and everyone that it touches. But sin in and of itself is not complicated. Sin happens all the time. It's universal. There's no part of the world, there's no culture, there's no environment, there's no people group, there's no nation, there's no family, there's no individual that is immune from sin. In fact, with the exception of Jesus Christ, there's never been a single person who has ever lived in this world who has not sinned. So again, sin is universal, it's always been part of the human story, and in fact, sin is what defines the human story. And sin is universal because all people share a common ancestry in Adam and Eve, the first human sinners. And interestingly enough, the universality of sin is not only an argument for the existence of a common ancestry, it's also an argument against evolution. The fact that sin is universal presents a fundamental problem for the evolutionist. You see, the, the human life, as interpreted by the evolutionists, claims that what the Bible refers to as sin is merely, and I quote, imperfection within the species, which will gradually improve as the species continues to evolve so as to one day disappear. How are we doing with that? <laughs> Given the fact that, that according to the evolutionists, we've, we've been here in some sort of form, either goo or what have you, or a monkey, or finally as a human being, for you know, billions of years, how has this issue of sin evolved? How have we advanced? Have we really become better? Well, if we've become better at anything, it's been, become better at sinning. That's what we've become better at. So there seems to be a fundamental problem here. In the evolutionist understanding of sin and morality, human life began at the bottom of the moral ladder and has been continuously progressing upward. So again, we began in soup, 
enthused out and we became some sort of, of, of cell and some sort of kind of life form and it's just been evolving upward ever since. But we started at the bottom and we started at the bottom of the moral ladder as well. We've been continuously progressing and thus evolving through the means. And here's the means education, and more positive environmental factors so that human beings have advanced to the top of this evolutionary moral pyramid and are actually progressing upward to even greater moral heights given more time, more education, and more positive environmental stimuli. Hmm. But the big problem with this kind of reasoning and this whole theory of evolution as it pertains to human beings and sin, is that human beings don't seem to be becoming more moral and less sinful. And if it seems to you that they are, it's only because we've become very good at redefining what sin is. So as to appear more moral and less sinful. Nor do we see human beings who live in superior environments with superior education as having a superior moral compass and being less sinful people than those people who do not have these kinds of advantages. I mean, from what I'm understanding, the vast majority of the anarchists that are torching Portland and other cities in the U.S. aren't lacking in education or privilege, white or otherwise. They're very educated. They're not working, but they're educated. And they've got privilege. And their big struggle is that they're dealing with this guilt that's been placed upon them by an education system that they can't deal with because of their privilege, quote unquote privilege. The gospel has an answer for that. Amen. You run to Christ, you run to the cross. Listen, if you're going to find other ways to take care of whatever guilt it is that you're feeling, you're going to find the wrong ways and you're going to end up hurting yourself and hurting other people as well. What we're seeing and what we have always seen in history is people, regardless of how well educated they are and regardless of how positive their environment is, sinning just as much and just as heinous if not far worse than those people with less education in a less than positive living environment. It's interesting that the guys that, that I work with overseas, most of those guys, especially in the northern part of Africa, live in the bush. They live in mud houses, thatched roofs. They all have a cell phone, and they get their internet every once in a while. They pay enough money for the month. They get a little bit of internet. And they are fascinated with the news in the U.S. And they, for the life of them, cannot figure out why we are burning down our own cities. They can't figure out why we are destroying our own technology. They can't figure out why are you revolting against a government and a system that treats you so well. They just can't figure this out. And they, they, they write to me and they say, what is wrong with you? What's wrong with you people? Well, sin is what's wrong. It's sin. So this evolutionary idea that human beings began at the bottom of the evolutionary quagmire and have progressed and advanced to their current state can't account for sin. It does not account for the universality of sin. It can't account for the fact that sin is universal. Because according to the evolutionists, it's supposed to be getting better and it should have disappeared. But the Bible here in Genesis 3 can and does account for human sin and for universal human sin, which isn't getting better but keeps getting worse given more time, more education, and more environmental improvements. In fact, the Bible is the only religious book that, account for, that can account for the sinful human condition and the fact that the human sinful condition is universal 
and always has been universal all through history. And, and here in the Bible, in Genesis 3, we don't see human beings starting at the bottom of the moral ladder, but rather they start at the top because God created them in his image to be at the top until they sinned and they fell. And interestingly enough, we see sin showing up in a perfect place, a perfect environment, if you will, amongst two people who were completely innocent and really as perfect as any human being could possibly be, who were living a dream life with God and had everything they could have imagined and more. You want to talk about a good positive environment, Adam and Eve had the best environment anybody's ever had. And they still sinned. They still blew it. So the Bible would not affirm the age-old lie that all we need to do is improve people's environments and provide them with advantages and privileges and social status and, of course, money, and we'll see them rise to new heights. Nor would the Bible affirm critical race theory, which says just get rid of, get rid of the white peoples so that everybody else can have a share of the pie. Because that's what critical race theory is saying. White superiority and Christian superiority is the problem today. No, sin is the problem today. It doesn't matter what color you are. And the gospel is the only answer. It's not deciding, well, now we're going to go against this color, and then, then when the other colors start to rise up, well, then we'll go against them. And by the way, we are not a bunch of different races. We are one race. It's the human race. Amen. And the fact of the matter is we're all just a different shade of brown. <laughs> so again, the Bible doesn't affirm these lies that we're hearing today. These lies that if you just improve people's environments, if you just give them more, provide them with more advantages, a superior education, give them money, pump money into the system that we're going to see humanity rise to new heights. And, and this is the basis of liberal thinking when it comes to politics and this whole idea of creating a perfectly good, fair, and just society. I mean, this was President Lyndon Johnson's dream and agenda back in 1964 when he and Congress implemented a bunch of major social domestic programs in our country to eliminate poverty, eliminate crime, eliminate racism, and thus create the great society. Well, in 56 years, how have we done? I'd say today would be a slap in the face to what he was thinking back in 1964. In Johnson's own words, we are going to assemble the best thought and the broadest knowledge from all over the world to find our answers. From these studies, we will begin to set our course toward the establishment of a great society. And with your courage and with your compassion and your desire, we will build this great society. And of course, we look back 56 years and we see that this great society promised far more than it delivered and did not solve any of these problems whatsoever. In fact, in spite of countless billions of taxes collected, dollars spent, millions of gallons of ink spent, producing millions of pages of bureaucratic policy and legislative mumbo-jumbo, we're in worse shape today as a nation than we've probably ever been in before. And the reason for this is because President Johnson's study groups failed to study the right book, Amen. the Bible. They just went and found their own books. And you know what? If they couldn't find them, they just wrote them. And when we don't take our cues from the Bible, especially when it comes to this whole problem we all have with sin, we're going to be spending all kinds of money, all kinds of time, all kinds of energy and effort barking up the wrong trees, and we're going to find ourselves no better off. Whether it's the New Green Deal or the Green New Deal or whatever they call it, or whether it was Roosevelt's deal. Um, you just keep going back. 
You know, man tries to solve man's problems without understanding what man's problems come from. And man's problems all come from sin. Sin is the source of problems. And they refuse to go to the word of God because they are not going to humble themselves and submit themselves and surrender themselves to God. So what would they have found out if they had started with the Bible? Well, for starters, the Bible would have told them what sin is and how it affects our relationship with God, our creator, and how it affects our relationship with each other and how it affects the whole human race and how it affects the creation. And what we're going to see here just today, we're not going to touch on all of that today, but we see here in Genesis 3, 1 through 6, and I've already read that for you, is that sin is actually several things which can all stand alone, but usually stand together. So sin is actually several things which all can stand alone, but usually they stand together. Now, the, the actual word for sin is hamartia in Greek. It means to miss the mark. So if you were an archer and you set your target out there and you shot your arrow, it wouldn't matter if your arrow hit to the right or your arrow hit to the left. If you did not hit the target, you missed the mark. God really doesn't care whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you, whatever you are on that spectrum, if you've missed the mark, you've missed the mark. Okay? It doesn't matter which side of the target you missed the mark on. So some people are going to say, well, we're conservatives, and so we're better than those liberals. Not if you miss the mark, you're not. You know, you're not going to stand before God at the great white throne one day and say, but God, I was a conservative. I think that that's going to get you in the heaven. Or God, I was a Democrat or a liberal. I think that that's going to get you in the heaven. Uh-uh. See, we're, we're the ones that, that set those kind of criteria. God says there's, there's one target. There's one mark. And he says perfection. He said, you must be as I am. And if you're not perfect as I am perfect, you're in trouble. And so then he said, well, then how's anybody going to have any hope? That's why Christ died on the cross. So that he might take our sin and give us his righteousness that we might have the righteousness of God that we might be able then to stand before God. But apart from that, we can't stand before God. We have no standing apart from the righteousness of Christ. But here's what we see as far as what sin is in practical terms. When I say miss the mark, let's look at a little bit more practical. First, sin is distrust of God in which we simply do not trust him to know what is best for us, and so we decide what's best. Now, all of these are going to be found in Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Adam and Eve did every one of these things. And we've been through the passage before, so I'm just going to list these things right now for the sake of time. First, sin is distrust of God. Second, sin is disbelief of God. Disbelieving what he has said to us in his word. So sin is to distrust God, Sin is to disbelieve God. Now, every time you and I sin, we are not trusting God because we're not believing what he's told us is right and what he's told us is wrong. We don't believe him. Adam and Eve did not believe God or they would not have taken the fruit that he told them not to take. Third, sin is dissatisfaction with God. Dissatisfaction with God in which we do not find God to be enough. He's just not enough. He alone, as he offers himself to us, is not sufficient. We want more. We want God plus our comfort. We want God plus our convenience. God plus safety. God plus security. God plus opportunities. God plus a solid financial portfolio. God plus a nice home. God plus a good job. God plus a spouse and a family who loves us. God plus my toys. And on and on we could go. Now there's nothing wrong with those things. But if if you're wanting those things with God and God is not enough, if he took all of that away from you, would he be enough? And if you say, I don't think so, well then you've got a problem with God. And you might want to get it settled. 
He didn't save you to have you and I desire all his good gifts without desiring him. And sometimes that's the problem for us. You know, I doubt that many people in this room are ever going to go down and be arrested somewhere in town because you're doing drugs or you, you, had, you, know, you got drunk and you hit somebody or you involved yourself in some big crime or what have you. I doubt that's going to happen. Um, you know, we, we're probably not going to be caught doing those kinds of things. Our sin problems may fall in another place. It may fall in that place of all the good things God's given us. We may not want the bad things. We best, might just fall in love or be too much in love with all the good things so that we have forgotten God. That's probably what's going to hit most of us is that God himself is not enough. We need to have our comforts, our conveniences, our safety, our security, and all these other things that I listed. Along with dissatisfaction with God is discontentment with God's plan. That's another form of sin. And I kind of put those two together. Whenever you and I are discontent with God's plan and God's gifts that he's given us, with the situation God has provided us in our lives, that also is sin. Fourth, sin is disobedience to God in which we see which way he's told us to go in his word, but we choose another way, another path, a different road. And if we can't find that different road, we just create it. Fifth, sin is disrespecting God by distrusting, disbelieving, and being disobedient to him. Listen, every time we choose to sin, that is disrespecting God. And, and it is especially worse for a believer than an unbeliever because the believer knows better. The believer has been forgiven of their sin. The believer has come into a relationship with God. And so when the believer purposely chooses to sin against God, knowing what they are doing, that is far worse than an unbeliever who is choosing to sin. And it disrespects God. And remember, everything you and I do is always played out publicly in front of him. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but it's also played out before the angelic and the demonic world. Did you know that? There is nothing that you and I don't do that God does not see. And nothing that you and I do or don't do, if we're supposed to do it, that the angels don't see. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10, we're told that the whole angel world and the whole demonic world is watching us and learning things about us. Back over there for a little quick. I need to show you this. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, Paul is, is writing to the church at Ephesus. And he's giving them some insights behind the scenes. And he says in verse 8, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what was the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So he's talking about our salvation. Now look at verse 10. So that the manifold or the varied or the extraordinary, multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That's the angels and the demons. And the words made known there is the idea that they may see and learn things about God through watching us and watching how God deals with us. See, the angels are amazed that God forgives us. They, they just can't get over the fact that God would have mercy on creatures like us when he had no mercy on the angels that followed Satan in his rebellion. They're amazed. But God is teaching these spiritual authorities about himself. And he's using us as the teaching aids. Keep in mind, we're not the only creatures that exist. There's a whole angelic world of righteous and fallen angels who are learning things about God themselves 
as they watch how God deals with us. That means that everything you and I do is public. It's not private. It's not private. And that disrespects God when we who know better choose to sin against God. Sixth, sin is denying God as your Lord whenever you choose to disobey him, whenever I choose to disobey him. Jesus himself said, how can you call me Lord and not do what I say? How can we call him Lord and not obey him? And so whenever we sin, that is denial of God as our Lord. You know, we, we often look at, at Judas Iscariot being the betrayer of Christ. We look at Peter denying Christ when Christ was being tried the night that before he's going to be crucified. And we all like to say, well, we would never do that. We do it every day. Every time we sin, we deny him. Every time. It doesn't matter whether it's big or little or somewhere in between. Seventh, sin is delighting in something or someone other than God when we choose it or them over God. There's another word for that. It's idolatry. Idolatry. Whenever you and I delight in something or someone other than God, that's idolatry. Eighth, sin is disloyalty to God. Whenever we disobey him, which is nothing less than to rebel against him. You know, the, the thing that I, I like to think about, about life on earth is this. One day I'm going to die. And when I die, I will never have the opportunity to show my loyalty to my Savior again on this earth. You see, the way we show our loyalty to Christ is by saying no to sin. And when you die, there's no more sin. When you go to glory, there's no more sin. Praise God for that. But there's something that you lose, and that's the opportunity to show and prove your loyalty to Christ by saying no to sin. Because every time we say yes to sin, we are saying to God, I love sin more than I love you. And that's why I'm choosing sin over you. You know why sin is such a big deal to God? Because it's saying to God, I'd rather have my sin than you. And when we understand that God is the, there's no words to describe who he is as the ultimate being, the creator of all that is, the fountain of joy, the fountain of happiness, the fountain of all that is good, and we say we'd rather have sin over you that's disloyalty. That's also great stupidity. Ninth, sin is distorting God's image, his character, which we bear as his image bearers. So that by sinning, we distort and we pervert what God is really like. Because God does not sin. And finally, sin is nothing less than disowning and displacing God. Look over at Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verses 11 through 13. Jeremiah 2, 11 through 13. When God reduces all human sin, he reduces it down to two things. And here's what he reduces it to. So I, I kind of look at that and I think, well, that's a good thing. You know, if God were to take all my sin and just reduce it down to two, I'd be very happy. I'd rather go with the two than with everything else, okay? But here's the two that God reduces all human sin down to. It's found in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Let's start in verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. And again, I say, wow, only two. Oh, that's good. But every sin gets put into these two. They have, number one, forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What he's saying is this. When you reduce all of... People's sins down to two. Here's what they are. 
Every time we sin, we forsake God and we replace God with something that cannot hold water. So all sin is nothing less than disowning and displacing God with whatever has now become God for you. So, so all of those things I mentioned are what sin is. That's what sin looks like. And we see Adam and Eve doing all of these things in Genesis 3, 1 through 6. And then in Genesis 7 through 13, we see how Adam and Eve try to deal with their sin, which is the same way we try to deal with our sin today. So much for evolutionary advancement and progress. We're still doing the same thing they did back then. So, so notice that after sharing the forbidden fruit with her husband in verse 6, that both Adam and Eve's eyes are open in verse 7, and they realize that they're both naked and vulnerable and ashamed of themselves because the guilt and the shame of their sin against God is now coming to bear upon them. And so what do they do? What do they do once they, for the first time in their existence, feel guilt and feel shame and know that their relationship with God has been broken? What do they do when that terrible sense comes upon them? Well, what they should have done, what we should do, they should have run to him. They should have just got up and run to him. They should have called out to him. They should have, instead of trying to hide themselves and hide their sin and hide their shame and hide their guilt, by spending the day sewing big fig leaves together so as to cover up their shame, that's what they do, they should have run to God for his mercy and his grace and his compassion. But, but that's not what they do. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. That, that means that they, they know something's changed now. And they sewed fig leaves together and they made themselves loin coverings. God's giving us a picture here of what human beings do to try and deal with their sin. Here's what we do when we try to deal with our sin and we don't want to go to God with our sin. We get busy by trying to produce good works so as to cover up what we've done wrong and hopefully earn God's forgiveness and merit. That's the picture God's giving us here. This was the wrong thing to do. So sometime in the morning, it appears they have sinned against God. Later in the evening, God is heard walking in the garden. And so sometime between their sin in the morning and this evening time, they are spending their day trying to find big enough fig leaves that they can sew together so as to cover what they have done wrong, to cover the effects of what they've done wrong. You see, they felt dirty. They felt ashamed. They felt exposed, guilty, sinful, and they felt really bad, just like you and I do when we sin, if our conscience has not been seared. Listen, it's a real dangerous thing if you've gotten to the point in life where you can sin and not feel bad about it then you are really in big trouble. Because God, in order to get your attention, is going to use a hammer and a tubifor, and he will crush you. And there's many people that we know who have had to be crushed by God because their conscience has become so seared they don't feel bad about their sin anymore. And when God crushes them, that is mercy. Mercy. That is grace. They felt what we should all feel when we sin against God, dirty. Everything that our culture tells us we should not feel. But we do feel it anyway, even though they don't want us to feel this. We feel dirty, we feel ashamed, exposed, guilty, sinful, and really bad. And so our instinct, our impulse is to do something about it because we don't want to feel this way anymore. So the first thing we do is let's get busy. Let's get really busy. Because if we get really busy, we don't have to think about it anymore. And because God often comes to us at night, 
when we're trying to sleep. But we can't sleep because the Spirit of God won't let us sleep and our conscience won't let us sleep. Well, now it's time for the sleeping pills. Now it's time for that little drink because we've got to sleep. Because we've got to hide. Because we don't want to deal with this with God because we can't deal with it. There's nobody here that doesn't know what I'm talking about. But it didn't work, did it? It just took you deeper into a world you didn't want to go into. And that's what it does for Adam and Eve too. It's just going to take them deeper than they really wanted to go. It did not work. And we know it didn't work because when they hear the sound of God in the garden in verse 8, they don't come out to model their new clothes for him. You know, when, when, when uh, my kids, when especially the girls, they go out and they get some new clothes, it's a big thing. I'm going to show Dad what they, what they bought, those new clothes. And, you know, I want to see these new clothes. They model those new clothes. That's kind of an exciting thing. They didn't want to go model their new clothes because it didn't work. It didn't help. Their works did not solve their problem. So they ran and they hid from the Lord among the good trees of the garden. You see, their busyness in trying to cover up their sin by spending the day making clothes out of fig trees didn't remove their fear of God's presence because good works can't remove or make up for our sins. So in verse 9, the Lord calls out to the man. The Lord God called the man. He said, where are you? Now, no, God, God's not, you know, doesn't have this uh, problem with his GPS. He doesn't know where the man is. It's like it's, it's God's asking him a rhetorical question. Adam, do you know where you are? Do you know what's happened to you? Do you know what you've done? It's interesting, God does not go after the woman first or even Satan first. He goes after the man first. That's significant. And that's because God had made the man the authority over the earth and had made Eve, his wife, to be his helper. That's why he goes after Adam first. So God starts with Adam because the buck stopped with Adam because he was the one God created first and chose to be the spiritual leader or the high priest in the ministry of taking care of the Garden of Eden, which really was the very first tabernacle and temple on earth, the place where God dwelt with man. See, the temple was going to be the place where God dwelt with man. The tabernacle was going to be the place where God dwelt with man. And that's why in the tabernacle and in the temple, they have on the walls pomegranates and palm trees and all this lush vegetation pictured there. And why there's cherubim there? Because it's a picture of the Garden of Eden which is where God was going to dwell with man. Adam was going to be the high priest of that. He was going to be the caretaker of all that. We see the same thing today where the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 11-15 tells us that women are not to assume the pastoral role and function in the church because that's reserved for men. And then he states why. Because Adam was created first. It doesn't say because Adam was better or smarter or more spiritual. God says, it's the way I created it. It's the order that I created it. Furthermore, God had chosen Adam to be the spiritual head over his wife and his family. Which is what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11.3, which says, but I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. God just says, listen, I'm calling you out, Adam, because I put you in charge. And that's why God calls for Adam first. He was our representative. The Bible tells us it was through him that sin entered the human race. Paul says this in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all people sinned in Adam. And so God is holding Adam primarily responsible for this mess in Genesis 3, 9 through 12. And look at what Adam does. Look at what Adam does. When God asks him if he knows where he is, if he knows what's happened to him now that he has sinned, and how did he know he was naked, and did he eat from the forbidden tree? Look at verse 12. Here's Adam's response. The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. Now, we want to say that he blamed Eve. No, he blamed God. 
He blames God. He says, the woman you gave to me. The woman you picked out for me. The woman you made for me. God, it's your fault. You know, God, if, if you hadn't put me in this family, I never would have done those things. God, if you hadn't given me this lousy small town to live in that has nothing to do for anybody, I wouldn't have gotten involved in drugs. Oh, God, if you hadn't given me this lousy job that I have, I wouldn't have felt compelled to commit embezzlement or whatever it was. God, it's your fault. So before blaming Eve, he blames God. So his response to his sin was first to try and suppress it by getting busy and making clothes out of fig trees to hide it. That doesn't work. So then he tries to run away from God and hides in the trees. That doesn't work because he runs right into God trying to run away from God. And that's what happens to all of us. And then he tries to hide from God by blaming God. He blames God. Little did Adam know that a day was coming far, far away when the very God he was accusing and blaming in the Garden of Eden, who is God the Son, Yahweh Elohim, we know him as Jesus today. The very God that he was blaming in the Garden of Eden for his sin would, in fact, in this same garden, the place where this garden originally was, Take the blame for Adam's sin as he died on the cross to pay for it. The very God that Adam was accusing and blaming would, several thousand years later, go to the cross and he would take the blame for that sin so that Adam could be saved. You see, that's what God has done for us, too. When Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sin, he went to the cross to take the blame for our sin, too, so that we could go free. And that's why we don't have to carry blame anymore and shame anymore, because the very God Adam blamed, who did nothing wrong, was willing not only to take yours and my sin, but to take the blame for that sin as well. Aren't you glad? Amen. And if you don't know Jesus, then you don't have eternal life. And you don't know God. And you will be blamed for your sin. And so I urge you, if you don't know Christ, run to Christ. Do what Adam and Eve should have done back then. They did it later. It should have done then. Run to Jesus. who will gladly forgive you and give you eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for being willing in Christ to take the blame for us. A blame that was ours through and through. A shame that was ours through and through. But you gladly bore our shame and the blame for our sin on the cross. It says, for the joy set before you, you despised that shame. And you died for us. Thank you. And I trust that those who, of us who know you will glory in our salvation and will live as saved people. And those that don't know you will run to you for the salvation you freely offer them in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.